Morning Bay City, we're so glad you could join us this morning. To start us off, I'd like to share a scripture from the book of Job, and this is from a time when Job was going through a really difficult situation. And um, so Job chapter 1 verse 21 says, And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in low, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's out as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name through the pain and the offering, the pain and the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in low, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Names, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed, blessed be your name. Yeah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Say you give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose. To say, Lord, blessed be your name. Yeah, you give and take away, give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be a glorious name. We say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Oh, bless. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be a glorious name. Jesus 
is the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. service we thank you for joining us but wherever we're at let's just close our eyes lord we love you and we thank you god for giving us this opportunity of worship um, of offering god of just giving some time to you and just some time of separation from our week um, god we pray that we will continue to uh just lift up your name today and, and 
throughout our lives, God, in, in the midst of this time. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Bay City Church. We have a few announcements before we get into the message. During this season, we want to make sure that everyone is able to get plugged into a church family. If you are new to Bay City or simply haven't connected with us yet, we would like to invite you to be a part of our community. Simply visit baycitysf.info and click either First Time Submitting or Bay City is My Home Church. You'll be able to submit prayer requests, find out about serving opportunities, or get the Spotify playlist for our worship set. You can also find out more about how to be a part of our city groups. City groups are our midweek gatherings where we get to interact with other people from our church, study the Bible, and pray together. During this time, our city groups have all moved to gather online through Zoom. Join a group today at baycitysf.info. One of the ways in which we worship God is through giving. We serve a generous God, and we want to honor Him through our giving. That's why during this unusual time, we are giving 10% of our giving back to help people, organizations, and businesses that have been directly affected by COVID-19. You can give financially on baycitysf.info, or you can go to baycity.church give to set up one-time or recurring donations. You can also give by texting any dollar amount to 84321. We hope you partner with us in serving those in need. Even though we are not physically meeting together, we want to continue to be a church that prays together. We are hosting a prayer meeting through Zoom, and we would love for you to join us. Bring your prayer requests as we gather to pray for our city and for each other. You can find a link on our website. If you are looking for ways to go deeper into studying God's Word, visit baycity.church resources. Here you will be able to find a list of our recommended books and websites that will help you in your walk. Don't go at life alone. Connect with us now at baycitysf.info. Now go ahead and grab a Bible as we get ready to study God's Word. Mary, can you say ha? Ha. B? Ha. Fa? Ha. Birds? Ha. Day! Happy Father's Day! Happy Father's Day, Daddy. We love you. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. Happy Father's Day, Daddy. Happy Good morning, Bay City Church again. Good to see you. Uh, hey, we're going backwards. Last week, we spent some time in Philippians chapter 4. We're going to go back to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 21. So if you have a physical Bible, please pull that out. I, I'm excited to explore this part of the scripture with you because there's some good stuff in here for some motivation. And uh, man, we could all do with some positivity in a rough season. So let me pray for us and uh, we'll get right into it. Lord, Thank you for being sovereign. Thank you for being true. Thank you for being good and perfect. We love you. Uh, I'm praying for my heart, friends, hearts and minds to be open and for those that are downtrodden to be motivated towards goodness and to pursue a great faith in your resurrection. So Lord Jesus, would you open our hearts and minds and would you bring us a spirit of positivity this morning as we get excited for the summer as it, as it comes and as some of the restrictions kind of fall back and we're able to go outside a little bit more. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I don't have to tell you 2020 has been a rough year. So um, look, in fact, if you were to think about 2020 as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, this meme would be it, right? Like, this is what I think 2020 has been like. And obviously what someone else has been think it's like because they created this meme. You know, a little humor what will probably serve us in such a hard season, you know, because hard seasons are difficult. They're really, really tough. But have you noticed when you look back at your hard seasons that it's in those hard seasons where you experience the most personal growth? 
I know I have. I look back at some of the hardest seasons in my life. I remember my mom was dying in that season of life. And I remember that that season made me who I was. And some of the harder seasons I faced in college and playing sports and being in different jobs and remembering, wow, like that hard season, I wouldn't want to go through it again. But I do know that it was so valuable for me. You know, it's in seasons of adversity that the extent of our faith shows itself. You see, in hard seasons, our faith gets tested. We get to prove out how faithful we are in the Lord Jesus and how resilient we are as a disciple. You know, hard seasons are actually when weak faiths show themselves and when they're revealed. So it's pretty easy to see when the sun is hottest, that's when the, the grass withers. You know what I'm saying? It's a weak faith can show us how, if, or rather a hard season can show us if our faith is weak or not. And when good seasons are good, it's easy, right? Some of you finance people, everyone can make money in a bull market. Everyone's making money. No matter what you throw anything into any stock for the most part, and you're going to win. As long as their CEO doesn't say anything racist or sexist these days, if that happens, you're going to lose some money. But for everything else, you throw it in a bull market, any, you're going to make money. You know, every real estate agent is always the best real estate agent in the market when the economy is flowing. When the real estate market is crushing it, everybody knows how good, you know, everyone is the best real estate agent. As, um, as the Zig Ziglar and Dave Ramsey would say, when the tide goes out, though, we know who is skinny dipping, right? When the, when the stock markets roll out, we know who was actually not as good, right? And that same is true for our faith. We understand that. So how will we respond in these hard seasons for our faith? How will we do it? With physical threats, coronavirus, emotional threats, uh, with anxiety and depression and suicidal thoughts, and then even communal threats to, with social injustice and police brutality and all of these things, how are we going to respond in a hard season? Well, Philippians 3, Paul, obviously you know, writes from jail. And he kind of writes this all-time great pump-up speech. I'm not going to lie to you. I love pump-up speeches, you know. Uh, any given Sunday or anything that Sylvester Stallone says in any Rocky movie, I am all in. I love those pump-up speeches. Paul here, though, writes an awesome one because his back is against the wall because he is in jail. He's been in jail. This is his second or third stint in jail. He's been crushed. He's been hammered his entire ministry. He could have easily thrown in the towel, so to speak, on his faith and on Jesus. He could have just said, you know what? It's not worth it. I can go back to living a good life. I was a, I was a well thought of Pharisee. I could have just go back to being doing that. You may find yourself in a season like Paul's, or at the very least, you might feel confused or stressed or angry. You might feel like you're in a season like that. But like Paul, all great things are worth battling for. If your faith is worth battling for, then it is worth pressing forward. All good things are worth laying it on the life for, laying it on the line for. Who's going to do that? And there's no greater prize to lay it on the line for than a new life in Christ. See, a new life in Christ gives you a new heart with new desires, with, with a, a secure and eternal future that you just don't have in other areas. So in a season like this, how do we keep going? How do we press forward in a hard season? Here's how. This is what Paul teaches us. Don't believe the lie that you have arrived. This is the first thing you can do. Because some of us are like, I'm good. I don't. I don't even need to worry about getting through a hard season. Like things are good. Job is good. I'm working remote. I'm traveling now. I'm at my family's cabin. Wow, well, yada yada. It's all good. I'm fine. Paul knew that growing in Jesus and becoming a sanctified, more sanctified version of himself would be a lifelong process of work. So you haven't arrived. Paul didn't arrive, right? Now, don't let your theology get in the way here, okay? G Jesus inaugurates your growth, okay? He's going to save you and change you and regenerate you, okay? All that's going to happen, but you actually still do need to work to become more Christ-like as you go because the great prize of an eternity with Jesus and a resurrected body that doesn't hurt or get sick is out there. Verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or I am already perfect, speaking of this resurrection, the perfect perfection in Jesus, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Now, this is going to fly in the face of a lot of pop psychology today, okay? This is going to merge. Now, today's world really does merge two things. It merges pop psychology and the gospel message. And so we talked about it a little bit a few weeks ago, but essentially this kind of pop psychology gospel will sell you, you know what? You're perfect. You're already great. You don't need to change. All you need to do is realize it. 
that there's gold in your spirit. You know, that doesn't sound so bad, but you know what I thought about this? That's a heck of a message for someone who already knows they're not that great. That's a heck of a message for someone who's had a hard life and that has really struggled. And and they go to a counselor or a pastor or go to a church and they hear, you're great the way you are. And they go, no, I'm not. I know I'm not great. I'm addicted to pornography. I'm addicted to alcohol. I, I steal money at work. I can't keep a boyfriend. I can't keep a girlfriend. My wife hates me. I can't read my Bible. I'm not great. I'm struggling. That's a heck of a message for people like that. It doesn't give them anything to strive for. And that's the exact opposite of what Paul is saying here. Paul shows a gritty faith in this message. Now, translating verse 12, it really could say something like this. I am attempting to, quote, seize the resurrection life like Jesus seized me right? Seize. Now, he's using a a, uh, military term here, seize, right? It's what he's using. And Paul may be alluding to how Jesus probably seized him on the road to Damascus. If you remember the story, Paul is going to persecute more Christians and Jesus shows up to him and blinds him and says, why are you persecuting me? Saul, his name at the time, calls him Paul, sends him off three days later or however long it was later. He then gets his sight back, right? He was seized by Jesus and made a Christian. Now, Paul's alluding to that. Jesus hijacked his life, overran his life. And Paul wants to then seize that resurrection life that Jesus has for him. You understand? You see, the fire in Paul's belly that he has for a relationship with Jesus was all created by him, Jesus, in the first place. That's beautiful. Paul's only desire to seize the life that God has for him is because Jesus first seized him. So if you want to seize anything, first thing you need to do is you need to be changed by Christ. Has the Lord seized you? Has he captured your heart? Has he transformed you by the power of the Holy Spirit? If he has, you're going to, in so doing, in that happening, you're going to now all of a sudden develop a desire to want to go seize the great life, the good life, the sanctified life that Jesus has for you. If you've been seized by Christ, it's now your turn to turn on the jets and to seize your destiny. The destiny that God has for you, pushing you in a deeper relationship with him. It's coming. Now, Paul is about as good of an example of a follower of Jesus as there's ever been. Okay, As good as there's ever been. And he has a lot of work to do, he says. He's like, I got to go seize this. Now, this flies in the face of modern New Age thinking. Because in modern New Age thinking means you think positively, you've got it. You're better. You ascend to a higher state of consciousness. You've already made it. You're already perfect. You're already perfect. Paul's declaration stands as a warning to the super spiritual. That's all of the people that think they've already made it like us. Even the greatest among us do not have this figured out. Now, next thing. We know, we know we, we're learning right here that we, we can't believe the lie that we've arrived, but then Paul says more. He says, forget what lies behind you. This is what we also have to do next. Paul turns his intensity up in this pump up speech. He's now focusing on his past. Look at verse 13. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it on my own. He's like, I haven't done this on my own. But one thing I do, forget what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind. Paul recognizes the need to grow in Christ as a catalyst for his faith, of course. He's, he knows that. I didn't do this on my own. But now he realizes that he has work to do as well. And what's the first order of business, friends? What's the first order of business? First order of business for Paul here is to forget his past. Paul decides he will not allow his past to keep him from attaining the resurrection in Jesus that he know he is an heir for. You understand? You know, many people don't realize this, but you can actually use the good and the bad of your past to, to hold you back if too carefully dwelled upon. So think about it. The good of your past can hold you back in this way. You think of the nostalgia of the former life you had before Jesus. Oh man, before I met Jesus, I was hanging out with these girls and these guys. I was having these drinks. I was just relaxed. I slept in. It was just so comfortable. I remember the good old days. That was so much better. And then the good old days can also, even in the Christian life, we could say, oh man, when I, when I got saved, I had such a fervor for Jesus. I would go to conferences and now my life is just not good anymore. And my faith is stagnant. I just can't engage God anymore. The good old days of the Christian life or in the non-Christian life paralyze us in terms of what God wants to do with our future. How many of you are allowing your past to freeze you in time so that way you can't evolve evolve and become something new? 
You could also use the bad of your past to hold you back. This is where your past owns you, right? It owns you. You might say, you might not say this out loud, but you live this. And just give, just if you've said any of these things, then this is you. You'll say things like, these are all the reasons why I can't strive ahead. Or I've tried everything. No, you didn't. Because if you had, you'd be where you want to be. Because there are people that are worse off than you that have strived past you. So that's not true. I've always been like this. Well, is that true? And if you have, can you change? This kind of thing always happens to me. No, you're just rewriting history because of the current mood you're in. Or my personal favorite and one that we always use, the one that I use the most, I will never change. That sure doesn't give very much power to Jesus. The natural question arises out of this and it's this. When did you decide to define yourself? When did you decide to tell yourself that you were not going to arise from the bad things that happened to you? You, my friend, are living in captivity to the things that have happened to you. Now, I'm not saying your past doesn't matter. Of course your past matter. There's much to learn from it. But when you allow your past to define you, you give those occurrences far more power than they actually have. Paul says, forget what lies in the past. You know, you just don't forget the past. Some of us are not just not forgetting it, you live in the past. You're not just remembering it, you live there. You've literally taken a 30-year mortgage out in your past. You've literally taken a job in the community. You're now wearing golden handcuffs at a job in that community. You were so rooted in five years ago that you'll never advance in the future. That's not what God is calling you to do. Living in your past is a trap. It causes you to look at your past failures as ultimate and defining. But your past doesn't define you, Jesus defines you. And if you're defined in Jesus, you're made new and you're made righteous and you're made clean. The sins that you've done, the sins that have been done to you have been wiped away and you're made new in Jesus. You know, it's funny because in fact, instead of dwelling on your mistakes, you can actually use your biggest failures. Use them as the things, as your biggest motivations. And so those failures, instead of dwelling on them, can actually be used to make you who you should become. Living in your past is a trap. So what should, do, what should we do then, right? Remember your past, but don't live there. Remember your past, but don't live there. Paul says, while we aren't living in the past, we should acknowledge it, learn from it, grow in it, and then move on. That's what Paul wants for you, and that's what I want for you, and that's what Jesus wants for you. Next thing, forget what lies behind, strain forward for what's ahead. Now we got to focus on the future. Now, some of us live in the past so much that we never focus on the future. Some of us only live in the future, which is why we're so anxious and stressed out all the time. Verse 13 says this, but one thing I do, Paul says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward for what lies ahead. Now, the word strain here implies it's actually going to be difficult to move forward, right? You're straining forward. It doesn't say reach gently, okay, like you're reaching for the remote control on the couch. He's saying, straining forward, the future is difficult. You're going to find that it's difficult to progress in life. It's difficult to get smarter, to earn money, to give more, to serve more, to become more sanctified in version of Jesus. It's going to be, you're going to find it's very difficult to do. Okay? That's going to be obvious and clear to you as you go. The fall brought thorns and thistles from this world that as we work our garden, this world will be difficult to work. It will be hard because of sin. So what happens when those thorns and thistles come in? We stop. We get complacent, we get bored, all of these things. As the old saying goes, rest too long and the weeds are gonna take your garden. Don't sleep on God's opportunity to conform you because you perceive growth as hard or difficult. It's supposed to be hard to grow. That's what Paul says, you're straining forward. You're gonna have to strain a little bit. The reason why it's comfortable to sit on the couch is because you're not straining. To grow, you have to strain. Paul understood that growth is a lifelong process and it's going to be struggle. And while the enemy of comfort and instantaneous living has lulled us to believe that things could be easy, a sinful person striving for a renewed spirit is always going to be difficult and that's us. Okay, next thing Paul teaches us, we need to press forward into the unknown. Press forward into the unknown. Paul uses military language again to conjure up images of a battle in his minds of the readers. Right? That's why he's using the word press forward. Verse 14, I press toward, 
I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know, this life is going to bring suffering, death. It's going to bring hardship. We've all experienced that recently. I sympathize with all of you who mourn the injustices in our community, somebody's death, sickness, hardship, all the things you experience. I sympathize. I've experienced those too. Paul has as well, but he says, nonetheless, I'm going to move forward anyway. That's the, that's the key. Now, who can say they've suffered more than this man, Paul, by the way? We talk about this every week. We're doing Philippians. The book is about suffering. Let's talk about his suffering again. Wrongfully imprisoned, jumped, stoned, taken captive. By the way, he also, for some of you, you might be thinking, you know, I, I feel like it's not that uh, I've, a lot of bad things have happened to me. It's that I've done a lot of bad things. I just can't get past them. Who's done worse than Paul? Paul oversaw the murders of innocent people. He literally was, a, he was literally working for an oppressive government, killing innocent people and watching them die. That's what he did. He became a believer and had to live with that in his conscience. You, my friend, as someone, as a believer, has a responsibility to continue forward into the gift of the resurrection that Jesus Christ has earned for you. You have a responsibility to press forward in the unknown. This is what we lost. And for the men here, this is what we've lost as men, is that we actually should be responsible and that we should strive forward to an ultimate good and be something more than just a, a passive person who sits back and allows calamity to happen around us. Now, some, some people will sit back and not bear the responsibility of the mission unless the outcome of that said mission will reveal itself beforehand. I got to know where I'm going if I'm ever going to get up, but that's not the call of God. That's never been the call of God. God says, go, go forth and make disciples in many nations. Go to the land I have sent you. That's the story from everyone. David, Moses, Abraham, and to Peter and the disciples and to us, go. He does not reveal the result of the call. He does not give us the result, but he does reveal there will be a prize. A prize, you might be thinking. And I understand this. You might be saying prize. What do I want a prize for? What do I want some purple stuffed animal for as I redeem tickets for? I don't want a prize. Communities are dying. Politics are crazy. A president's nuts. Global pandemics are still looming. I don't need a prize. The reconciled world that you seek is the prize. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not just a privatized faith where you get to go up to ascend into heaven and be with Jesus. The reconciled world that you seek is the prize God has, has for us. We've lost the vision for a life of adventure that follows a hallowed call that presses us forward into the wild and into the fray. We've lost that. A life that calls us to marry one person, love your kids, work your job, provide for your family. Serve people that are different than you. We've lost that. And instead, we want this world of possibilities instead of a world of rootedness. A life that calls us to marry one person is a good. Love our kids is good. Serve family. Be different. Share the gospel. All good. Our world without Jesus doesn't offer a prize of renewal and reconciliation. All it, all it provides for us is empty hopes and wishes without Jesus. That's all it provides. Good longings, but lack of foundation. Do you understand? The world without the prize of Christ is like a dog chasing its tail. It's just like a dog chasing its tail. You might want it, but you're not going to get it. But if you do get it, like some dogs do, you won't have it for very long. Okay, that's the call. That's the pursuit of re reconciliation, renewal without Christ. There will always be calamity. Verse 15, let those who are mature think this way. If in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. You know, mature people know that their lives are, they know what the work entails in their lives because they know that they haven't made it. That's what maturity is. Maturity is like humility. You've lived long enough to know I'm not the guy, okay? I've got to grow. I need to be more mature. I need to press forward into life. Mature means you've been humbled. They know that the importance of the prize of Christ in their lives and how much bigger it is than their own selfish pursuits. So, conclusion. Paul closes us by kind of giving the end result of those who strive for the prize and those who do not strive for the prize. So, verse 18, Paul says this, For many of whom I have, told, I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. And then he says, the result, their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is their shame, with minds set on earthly things. 
Paul in tears, by the way. Man, this is hard to hear. Some of our friends, some of you watching right now, he gives us a glimpse of those who strive forward for not for the price in Christ. What they seek is a is separation from God and what God does give them is what they seek and that's separation from him. Not just today, but in the next life. And those people lack maturity because they claim to know all the answers. If you think you know the answers of this world, I'm sad to tell you, but you don't have them. You may, may have a good theory, but that theory can be disproven. And by the way, a 38 year old or 42 or 57 or 61 year old brain has not been around on earth that long. This eternal God has been around a lot longer. God doesn't call us to have all the answers in ignorance. He calls us to press forward in humility, learning along the way. And then what about the people that do seek the prize? Verse 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Now here we get the prize. You understand? The broken bodies that we have, the ones that are get sick, the ones that hate each other, the ones that judge each other by their skin color, the ones that get uh, brain fog and fatigue and dislike, all of that. God says, I'm going to renew those. And the resurrection body I'm going to give you is one that cannot die and cannot get sick. The prize is an eternity where you get to live your best life now. A secular life without Christ will never promise you that. Don't chase your spiritual tail any longer. Believe that the real Jesus can actually give you what he says he can. Let's pray. Lord, I want to pray for my friends here that they develop a gritty and gutsy faith this morning, that they can strive forward into the unknown of this life and rely on a good God that loves us. Lord Jesus, would you bless us, would you keep us, and would your light shine on us this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Love you, family. Great to see you. Hey, I hope to be with you in person soon, hopefully in the next few months, in the next few weeks, whenever the Lord has it for us. But until then, I'll see you next time. Give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name So you give You give and take away Yes You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Oh, bless. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Well, thank you, church, for being with us today. And uh, we'll just close out with some prayer. Thank you, Lord, for letting us have this day and this worship and this service, God, for the word. We thank you, Lord, and we are challenged by you, God. We pray that we'll continue to live out this week strong and uh, just have a great time in your presence, Lord. Thank you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It was a great Sunday worshiping with you, church family. Remember, don't go at life alone, especially during this unique season. Connect with us at baycitysf.info and plug in with us so we can all stay encouraged and joyful together. We want to hear from you. See you next week.